encourage you more than a sermon. I really just want to remind us of why we do what we do. If you're a member, if you're a leader, if you're a pastor, if you're a missionary, whatever your station of responsibility is uh, in the kingdom, how many are thankful that God has saved us, God has called us, and um, anybody else? Thank you, Philip Thompson, for the one clap over there. And so we're on the road to heaven, and everything that we do here on earth is how we've leveraged our life for God, and we'll be rewarded. Anybody pumped about rewards that we'll get when we get to heaven? And growing up as a kid in, in church, my, my dad was a pastor, my grandfather was a pastor, Papa. I'm, I come from five generations of pastors, which only means I'm more dysfunctional than you, so don't get no pressure there, but... But growing up on, on the pew in New Orleans, South Louisiana, uh, my dad had a little small church there, and I had some images of heaven. I had some, how many had some pictures of, especially if you season saints around here, you got some mileage with God, some, some thoughts as a kid, uh, even getting into my student ministry years, my teenage years, about what heaven would be like. And just even standing here today, and even back back in the day, Thinking about that, hearing songs about that, standing before you, I can't think of a, a greater thought than going to heaven. It's why we do what we do, and, and, and a purposeful pursuit of, of going to heaven and bringing people with us to heaven to introduce them to Jesus at some point. I can't think of a more blessed thought than going to heaven. I, I can't think of anything more joy-filled than than going to, to heaven. And for some of us who have kind of been around church for a little bit, a little bit it, I hope you don't mind, but can I just kind of take a stroll down memory lane a little bit? I'm going to lose everybody under 30 years old right now because y'all remember some of the songs like Beulah Land? Come on, say Beulah with me. I just like saying Beulah. 25 and under, you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. I'm longing for it. I mean, we, we sang these songs in, in church. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. Marching onward to Zion. That beautiful city of God. Come on, where's my old saints at right here? I mean, yeah, you're thinking about some of those, some of those songs. Or how about when we all get to heaven? What a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see who? We'll sing and shout the victory. Or, or how about this one? How about, we shall see the king. We shall see the king. We shall see the king when he comes. When he comes, he's coming in power. We'll hail the blessed hour. We shall see the king when he comes. Come on, let's give Jesus a hand. He gets all the credit anyway. He gets all the the fame anyway, and just hearing songs uh, about, about heaven brings you back to the glorious truth and the reality of going to heaven at some point. Or, or how about this, when I was a kid, when missionaries would come through my dad or my papa's church, and they would preach great sermons. I know there's sermons and songs about heaven today in 2020, but it almost seems like, how many are with me? Back in the 80s, back in the 70s, back in the day, it, it almost seems like there was more preached about heaven. There was more preached about the soon coming king or more songs that were sung about that. And man, would it cause us to burst with joy when some of these missionaries would blow through New Orleans and stop over at my dad's house and, and preach at the church and we would hear these incredible sermons about the kingdom of heaven and going to heaven someday. When we think about sermons and when we think about songs and we think about our experiences of, of, of heaven, in fact, my dad would share a, a story in one of his sermons. Uh, I remember it like it was yesterday, and he talks about how when he was 15 years old, he was on the deep end of the pool, and he was with his cousins and his little brother, my Uncle Pug. And there they were in the deep end of the pool, and he developed a cramp in his leg, and, and he grabbed that as they were rough housing, and nobody noticed. It was a community pool, and there was a lifeguard there, and there was no cell phones back in the day. And, and there he is, and he grabbed that leg, and then he toppled over, and then he couldn't get the strength to muster up. He started going down. He couldn't get the strength to surface up to the top of the water, and nobody noticed at all. Until all of a sudden, then, of course, the lifeguard notices and pulls him out of the pool and begins to start resuscitating 
him, and they throw him into an ambulance, and he goes all the way to the hospital. And when he gets to the hospital, it's over 20 to 25 minutes. My mom recalls, my dad shares this and while he's preaching this sermon, and he goes, but I saw the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in heaven. I saw the throne of God. I saw some of the most beautiful images that became a reality the 20 minutes that I wasn't resuscitated until they brought me back. And it was in those moments that I received the call of God on my life. Here's back in 2012 that one of my nearest and dearest friends, Craig Brzezinski, one of the finest Christians and leaders I've ever been around, I was in accountability with him in a men's group. He developed cancer at 47 years old. It was terminal cancer. He had four kids, his wife, April. And he said, Paul, take care of my kids when I go to see Jesus. He would pass on and go to, to glory. And, but just before he took his last breath, there was 40 people that were huddled in his master bedroom. And for about seven or eight hours, he had that, that gurgling thing happening. He was in his last minutes. And he had his eyes closed. And at the very last moment, I'm standing there with him. And I, I have a Bible. And I'm just sharing the gospel. I'm just sharing Psalm 23 with, with him. And he popped his eyes open. And he says, Paul, he says, I see it. He says, I, I see them. And he says, I see them coming for me, and they're coming right now, and I see it, and I can't wait to go. And he shut his eyes and breathed his last in the next breath, and the next time he opened his eyes, he was in eternity. And whether it be my dad talking about how he was resuscitated and got a call of God on his life because he experienced heaven that day, or whether it was Craig, Craig Krasinski that, that day, or, or I think about even my dad when he shares the story when he was 45 years old. And many of you maybe know the story, maybe you don't, but while he was preaching on a Sunday morning in March 27, 1988, actually to back up the week before, he's preaching on Elijah on March 20th. And Elisha. And while he's preaching the sermon in New Orleans, and I was 14 years old, and my, my younger brother was 12, and my older sister was 19. She was at LSU at that time. And, and so he's preaching on Elijah. He goes, wow, what a, he interrupts himself. He said, wow, what a way to go. Elijah going up in a, in a whirlwind, pleasing God, serving God, being a, a prophet of God. I, I would love to. He tells the church, I would love to. And I was sitting on the front row. I'd love to go that way. Pleasing God, pastoring this little church here in New Orleans. and In fact, if you have to drag me out of here feet first, that's the way I want to go is preaching the gospel of Jesus. We didn't really think a whole lot about it until the next Sunday, on March 27, 1988. It's a Palm Sunday, and in the middle of his sermon, while he's preaching, he steps off of the platform. He goes down the steps towards my family and right in front of our family, in front of the whole church, he topples over and he dies in the middle of the sermon. And a doctor from the back row comes up and runs up to the front and rolls him over and rips his shirt open and starts to resuscitate uh, Bill Mason on that day. And what he described for us and the church in a testimony service on the next Wednesday, he says, when I turn your father over, I'm just going to tell you right now, he had a tear in his eye, his eyes were shut, and this tear in his eye was streaming down his cheeks, and he had a smile on his face, and he was praying the house down. He says, I don't know what all that means, but I thought he was going to come back to life, but he was very awakened and more alive than ever, although he never opened up his eyes. He was seeing something, and his eyes were closed. And there was, a, there was a smile on his face, and in that moment, God squeezed him out of time and space and hugged him a little bit too hard and took Bill Mason right on up to be in eternity forever with him. That's what he lived for. He lived his whole life pleasing God and pastoring and, and preaching in that, in that small town. And whether it be songs like Beulah Land or We're Marching to Zion or sermons I heard as a kid or images that were conjured up or experiences that many of you might be able to share some of the stories of people who have experienced just a taste of heaven. And you've heard those stories recounted and, and told over and over. And the Bible is very vocal on what heaven, a lot of verses in the Bible about really what heaven is going to be like. But there's also a mystique about heaven. And the mystique is there's a lot that we don't know. 
But in that the Bible is very vocal in a lot of verses, there's a lot that we do know. And I know it's going to be a great and full of joy and a blessed place, and it's going to be a better place. But I just want you to see some realities of heaven that we all know. And I want to remind us of these things and encourage us in that, number one, heaven is a real place. Can I hear a good amen to that? Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. Here's some of the mysterious part of it that will become a reality. It did become a reality for Craig and my dad that day. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, Eye is not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. It's one of the reasons why we do what we do. Are you listening to me here today? Second truth about heaven that I want you to see out of the three things I want to give you this morning would be heaven is a relational place. It's going to be a place where we're going to enjoy our families and friends, those who have trusted Christ and died before us. It's going to be a place of a reunion, reunited, and it feels so good. Come on, somebody. I mean, it's going to be a place where Krispy Kreme, the, the donut light is always on, man. The red, it's flashing all the time. It's, it's going to be a place of rest. It's going to be a place that's blessed. It's, it's going to be a, a wonderful party where we'll celebrate with those who have walked the gospel before us. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. But even more important than me seeing Papa again and Mama again and Craig Brzezinski again and Dave and Jody Bell again and Bill Mason again, we're all going to see those. How many are looking forward to that place, all right? It's a real place, but it's also a relational place. But more important than even a family reunion is what the book of Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3, it's going to be a place where we're relational with God. On earth right now in the 70, 80, 90 years that we live, the vast majority of our lives that we're not going to be living here on, in this moment in our lifetime, there's times in ministry, there's times where we're like, where's God? I don't, I don't see him. Is he hiding on me? I don't, I don't feel him. Where did, he, where did he go? Can you imagine in heaven you'll never have those thoughts ever again? Revelation 21.3 proves it to us. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people and God himself will be with them, and they will be their God. What does all that mean? God wants to come over to your house. He wants to spend some time with you. He wants to hang with you. Come on, come on, church. Are you all looking forward to that? I mean, it's a real place. It's not a figment of our imagination, our theory, or whatever. It's, it's, it's a, a relational place. And thirdly, it's a, it's a rewarding place place. I feel like David Cook right now in IBC. I feel like I got the R's going on with, uh, with this sermon. But, and I say this just to motivate the fire out of you because this, this motivates me. It's, heaven is going to be a rewarding place. He sees everything that you do, everything that you've built. He sees every effort that you've made, all the striving and the straining, and he sees the faithfulness. I so look forward to the place where you and I will stand in front of our God and hear him say over us, well done, not undone, good, and like Ben was saying, faithful servant. Not well done, high-performance leader. And there's nothing wrong with that. Well done, good and faithful servant. How many would just want to hear those words from the lips of our Savior? That's, that, that means it all. That, that's what we live for. It's a rewarding place. So, Paul, are you working for in the time that you have here on earth for rewards? Absolutely. And I have no shame in the game. That's, that's exactly what I'm doing. It motivates me. And I don't have shame in the game because, yes, I sure am working right now. All the things that we're accomplishing in our ministries globally, we're working for rewards. I want to walk in front of the Lord and I want to hear him say, enter into the joy of the Lord forever. How many know salvation was God's work for us? Because he laid down his life for us, because he loved us so much, because he died for us and he rose from the grave and purchased our salvation. That was God's work for me. But my rewards are my works for God. 
And that, that's what I'm here on this, on this earth to do until I go see Jesus. I, I love this. This staggers me. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. I hope you get comfort from this and encouragement. This is what Jesus says. He says, and behold, I'm coming quickly. Y'all believe that, church? And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every one according to his work. You know what I love about what stuns me about that scripture? Jesus is so encouraged, he just can't wait to give you what he's got. And I know that's bad English, but it's good preaching. I'm just saying, he can't wait to give you his rewards. He has a posture that says, I'm not even going to wait for you to go all the way up to heaven for you to get there, and then I'll give it to you. On my descent down, I've got the rewards with me. I'm not even going to wait for you to get all the way to heaven. I can't wait to frisbee out all of the rewards that I have to give to each man according to the work that he has done. Can I hear a good amen to that? Come on, church. And he reminds us of what we're supposed to do until we get there. And what is it that we're supposed to do until we get and stand before him and get those rewards? And there's a singular verse that grabs me. It grabs my attention. It's found in John chapter 17, our last verse here today, verse 3. And Jesus kind of defines for us because as a kid, I did have some images and some pictures of what eternal life was and heaven was like. And then Jesus just kind of recalibrates me a little bit on this. And he says, now this is eternal life. It's five words. You want to know Paul and my eight-year-old body back in the day in my dad's pew? You want to really know what eternal life is? Is it a, is it a promised future? And, and it is. Is it a destination and a real place and a relational place and a rewarding place? Is it a place or, or what exactly is eternal life? And Jesus just boils it all down to what actually eternal life is. And he goes, now... This is eternal life, that they may, and they meaning you and I, that they may know you. And the word that he uses for know is not like cerebrally embrace God, like in a heady kind of way. Or like, let me become familiar with you, God, while I'm accomplishing all the works of the ministry while I'm here in this world. Or it's not like, let me just kind of get an acquaintance with you. That's not what he says is the word for no. The word no is union, and the word no is togetherness, and the word no is intimacy. And so Jesus just breaks it all down in pursuit of, in the response of the love of God that he's shown me on my life. He boils this thing down to say, you want to know what, Paul Mason, eternal life is all about? Now, this is eternal life life that you and I may know, like have an intimate union with you, God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life. And Jesus wants out of us, while we live here, before we get there, and while we're here, he says, I want out of you in the work of the ministry I want you to have a passionate union, vibrant, not hollow, but a depth of enjoying a relationship daily with God. And I just wonder if God just really wants our hearts. Before we do what we do, and we're supposed to do what we do, because I'm going to get reward, and I get pretty pumped about that. But before we do what we do, it's like, God, just to sit in, that's the greatest reward of it all. This is eternal life. And now I'm thinking in this context, it's not so much about the mansions anymore, and I'm really looking forward to the mansions. It's more about I can have a friendship with God right now. Are you kidding me? Like, I can have intimacy with God right now? Uh, Really? And that's really what God is is, is after, and he defines for us in John chapter 17 and verse 3 what's the most important thing. There's a lot of important things, but what is ultimate in the life of a missionary and a pastor and a leader and a man of God and a woman of God. 
And that is, in other words, when it's all said and done, and there's a lot of said and preaching, as Casey was talking, there's a lot of getting done in this globally, even in this room. But when we evaluate our lives at the end of the day, there's nothing that God desires more out of Paul Mason than a passionate, intimate relationship with you, Jesus Christ, and the only true God. Can I hear a good amen to that? And when we begin to fix our eyes on something other than that, we begin to start putting other things in front of Jesus. And then we're discouraged. <laughs> and then we're unfaithful. And then all of a sudden we're weary and we're leading on empty. And we're burned out because we don't recalibrate ourselves to how Jesus redefined what eternal life was really all about, getting back to knowing him. And when we begin to labor and strive, and we're supposed to do all that, so don't get me wrong, we begin to serve and build, and this can even happen in the ministry. Let me just say this. We run the risk of standing in front, and this will happen. It's a certainty. Standing in front of Jesus and hearing him say over my life and over your life, you failed at the very thing that I created you for, and that was a relationship with me. Because really, ministry is a relational overflow, isn't it? And out of this vibrant daily relationship, then there's, there's life and vitality that comes out of our hearts to pour our lives on people. And now I'm not thinking of heaven in so many terms of it being a destination and a promised future. I'm thinking about it being a relational person now. And so what is eternal life? Eternal life is the true treasure, the supreme treasure of it all. You know, you want to know what eternal life is? It is heaven. It's standing before the Lord, him saying, well done over our, over our lives. But eternal life really boils down into, you know what, I can have a relationship with God right now. Are you all listening to me here today? I just want to remind you of that. I just want to encourage you with that. And that's our prayer here today. God, thank you for saving us. Thank you, God, for calling us. In fact, why don't we stand to our feet all over the room here today. Everybody standing with us. Lord, thank you for giving your very best for us. Thank you, Lord, that we can pour our lives on, on people. God, until we see you face to face. I thank you, God, that you want our hearts. Lord, you have our hearts. Our hearts belong to you. You are eternal life, and that doesn't begin at a moment in the future when we see you face to face. We can actually have the privilege and the pleasure of seeing you face to face right now in this meeting. And so, God, I know that there were those who came to the meeting, but, God, we want to re be reintroduced to the man, Christ Jesus. I know that there, there are those who have come into this building, but we want to meet the builder of our marriage and our family and our lives and rebuild, God, our heart and reignite, Lord, the passion and the fire of God that comes only from you. And out of that, Lord, we can be a blessing to so many people. I thank you, Lord. We'll all stand before the Lord at some day, and you'll give us some treasures, and you'll dole out, and you'll frisbee out to us rewards for all the things that have been accomplished and how many souls have been saved by the thousands and millions even represented in this room and outside the doors. Because whatever we do in here would fill the streets and the cities and the regions and the globe out there. And I thank you, God, that we'll stand and you'll give us our treasures and you'll give us our rewards. What a day of rejoicing that will be. And we'll take those things and we'll throw those crowns right back and lay it right back at the feet of Jesus because the greatest, most ultimate thing and most precious treasure in our lives is being with you in eternity in heaven and being with you right now in the name of Jesus we pray and everybody said a good amen to that. Come on, let's give Jesus a hand in this room.